I want to draw your attention to a new book out by Tony Payne called Learn the Gospel. We've just updated the wording and things like that and updated the training programs in Two Ways to Live. And uh, Tony is the man, the wordsmith who does it. You'll see the books I've written are often written by me and Tony Payne, which means they're actually written by Tony Payne. <laughs> and that's why they're readable, you see, because he, he's just a wonderful wordsmith is our Tony and a great man. Um, and he's produced this new book on teaching two ways to live and how to learn two ways to live and the doctrine that lies in two ways to live. And so I really would be commending that one at the moment uh, because I represent Two Ways Ministries. It's a, uh, it's a great book. And if you want to be using Two Ways to Live, you've ever seen it, you want to use it, then can I commend you, learn the gospel with Tony Payne's new book. Now that I've done that, I'll just reorganise myself here. Oh, good on you, brother. What a marvellous man he is. <laughs> He really is, isn't he? What a blessing to us to have him with us. Now, uh, if I can turn this on, and I'm always scared this is going to run out of battery. No, 100%. Where is this? I'll be able to go for four hours. Um, <laughs> so finally, we come to the how-to session of everyday evangelism. And if you've actually just understood what CS said to you, you'll realise a how-to session is a rather strange session because the how-to is not the important bit. As is so often the case with the Bible, the how-to is left unstated because it's not important. It's not as important as what we do and why we do. It's, not, um, it, it's a matter that's open to change as you move into different circumstances, different phases of life, different cultures, different suburbs that you might live in the evangelism it's more important that we do it than we spend endless time talking about how we should do it right because it's that that Spurgeon quote you know I'd rather the evangelism I do than the evangelism you don't it's into the Bible even a how to at one point the disciples come and ask Jesus how to pray John the Baptist the Pharisees they teach their disciples how to pray Teach us how to pray. And Jesus then says, well, you kneel down, you put your hands upwards, you close your eyes. No, he doesn't. What he teaches them is what to pray. For he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. It's nothing on the how-to. doesn't. You can pray standing, you can pray sitting, you can pray lying down. You can pray in bed. You can pray under the shower. The how-to of your bodily state, whether you're sitting or standing, kneeling, eyes closed, eyes open, hands together, all irrelevance. Doesn't matter. But what we're praying is how to pray. And so... You can't expect the Bible to be going to teach you much about the how-to on what to do. But there is one passage that I want to draw your attention to today. So we're not much Bible flipping today, not much PowerPoint flipping today, because we're going to look at Colossians. Because in Colossians, there's a passage. It, it's really not about how-to. But it does talk to us about relating to outsiders. So if you can find Colossians, which I can't in my Bible, someone's nicked it, just a minute while I find it, Colossians chapters 3 and 4. It's the little bit in chapter 4 we're going to spend our time on, but I always like to put it in its context so we can really understand what is being said. So let's pray that God will help us do that, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do pray now that we've opened your scriptures to this passage, that by your spirit you would give us the understanding of what it is that you are saying, what you said through Paul to the Colossians and what you are saying to us today. Help us to understand that message, Father, that we might live in obedience to you, that we may bring glory to you, that we may work at reaching out, we may work at making disciples, we may work at building the community, that we may work for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's place it in the context of chapter 3. We have here what is called a household code. I'm on page 18 on, the, uh, on our booklets, and I'm at point 1 there, the household code. It occurs a couple of times in the New Testament. You'll find it in Ephesians. You'll find it in 1 Peter. It's where they address 
various members of the household with the kind of ethical instructions appropriate to their particular positions in life. So here in Colossians, we read the general principle back in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then it applies that general principle, whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, applies that general principle to different members of the household. So if you look in chapter 3, verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as if, verse 19, husbands, love your wives. And verse 20, children, obey your parents. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your... Verse 22, slaves, obey in everything. And then you've got to slip down and slip down until you come to chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly. And then you come to the general principles of chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. So in the context of talking about how we're to live as Christians in our different situations of life, he then comes back to how we all should be living as Christians in chapter 4, verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You see, it's not a how-to on evangelism, but it does speak of our lives in Christ in terms of our relationship to outsiders, which includes Paul's speech to outsiders and our speech to outsiders. And remember, evangelism is just speech. It's speaking to people about our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So let's turn our attention to what God says here in this little passage, chapter 4. Firstly, constant prayer. Verse 1, continue steadfastly in prayer. Uh, prayer is the natural breath of the Christian person. See, we live in faith and by faith. Now, that word faith is such, a, such an important word to us and so totally misunderstood in Australia that I actually think we most likely need to get rid of it. Sad, because faith, justification by faith alone is one of the great turning points of the history of mankind. I mean, faith is just riddled through the Bible. But unfortunately, faith means superstition to outsiders. And that's not what we're, we're not justified by superstition. That's, that's not what it means. But I'm sorry, that's what most Australians think it means. It's a kind of leap into the, into the realm of irrationality. What does faith mean? It means trust. It means depend. It means rely. Now, there's three good English words that no one's in any doubt as to what they mean. Huh? I trust, I rely, I depend. I trust you, I trust your words, I trust you trust in the chairs you're sitting in. We all know what trust means. We all know what relying means. We all know what depending means. And that's what the Bible means by faith. And it's got nothing to do with superstition. You know, I'm not a superstitious depender. Uh, it, it, it's got nothing to do with it. And so we've got other good words. And faithful, yes, dependable, reliable, trustworthy. See, we've got, we've got really good English words that mean what we mean. And when we're talking to the outsider, we've got to be very careful of this word faith because what they're hearing and what we're saying are two different things. Little point of issues. But see, prayer is articulating, is speaking, is expressing our faith our trust, our reliance, our dependence upon God. For when I ask God for
for anything. I'm relying upon God. I'm depending upon God. I'm, try, I'm expressing my reliance on God. I'm expressing to him, I'm depending upon you for this. Prayer, by the way, is not the same thing as thanksgiving. That's why with thanksgiving is added in the verse in front of you. You pray with thanksgiving. That's because the word pray means asking. That's what prayer is. It's asking God for something. And because we ask God for things, we can always thank God for things as well, can't we? In fact, there's never a moment you can't thank God because there's just so many things to thank God. I looked out of the sky this morning and I thank God. It's not raining. Stanwell tops of a lot of rain. But it was more than that. I just loved the sheer blue that was above me. And then I saw the wind and I prayed that God would calm that. Because uh, I know it's a bit bitter down here sometimes. Uh, but I can always thank God for things. You can as a little child, I was taught to sing a song, which for your benefit, I'm not going to sing, <laughs> called Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings two by two, and it, I, it went up to four. <laughs> Hands up those who have ever sung Count Your Blessings. Hey, you can tell the old people, they've got to get the person, <laughs> got to get the person next to them to help them get the arm up, you know? <laughs> but... It was a great thing to teach little children. I'm so glad that the Sunday school I went to taught me the Word of God, taught me to think Christianly, even though I didn't understand what we were singing. I had no idea what count your blessing meant. I didn't know what count meant. I didn't know what blessing meant. I didn't know what your meant. That was me. So, but when you come to Christ, you realize, yes, we've always got something to think, thank God for. What are the characteristic differences between Australia and America is their Christian foundation. You see, the American legend goes back to the Pilgrim Fathers. Now, most of the Americans didn't come as pilgrims, but that's their foundation, wasn't it? People fleeing Britain, fleeing Europe, because they were being persecuted for believing in the gospel and setting up, therefore, a Christian state. Our founding kind of legend is convicts. And again, most of us don't come from convict family, although a few here I've seen. Uh, so <laughs> we don't come from that background, but that's our founding legend, isn't it? And so we are, again, the government. Whereas they, they have thanksgiving. We're inheriting all kinds of things from America, Big Macs and, and, and uh, terrible television and, uh, you know, basketball. Uh, um, which was actually invented by a Christian in the YMCA trying to evangelise young men during winter. And if you know that about uh, Dr Naismith, look him up sometime, Google him up. Anyway, it was actually a Christian game destroyed by capitalism. And so we, we inherit all kinds of things. We're now inheriting from America um, uh, Halloween. It, it goes back before America, but it's from the American version is what we're... We will inherit everything from America, but we will never inherit Thanksgiving. Because that goes against the Australian culture, you know? We've got no one to thank. Thank your lucky stars. <laughs> Don't know what my lucky stars do. And what about my unlucky stars? So, I mean, that's a daft stupid idea, isn't it? Because we've got no one to thank... We don't thank anybody. Whereas the Americans, because they were founded with a Christian content, a Christian concept, they actually have remembered this Thanksgiving. Sadly, as they're moving away from the gospel, so their Thanksgiving is becoming more about turkeys than God. But, you know, it still holds true that there is a difference. And you hear the Christianity because... We always thank God. And we've always got things. No matter how dire and grim your life is, if you stop and think about it, there's always things to thank God for. And as you thank God, it takes your eyes off the problems that are seeming to overwhelm you at the time. It's a wonderful thing. But praying is asking, not thanking. Thanking is what you do because when you've asked, you've been given it. It's a different thing. And the way we pray is to watch out for the times of trouble, to prepare ourselves for the time of trouble. So we pray with watchfulness. 
we're bound to fall into troubles in the world that we're in, the fallen world we're in, and we're bound to fall into troubles because we are following the crucified one. So like the disciples were supposed to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray, so we watch and pray. Prayer is also not simply talking to God. It's not that we just, there's nothing wrong with talking to God, it's just not what prayer is. Prayer is asking. That's what the word means, to ask. That's what the English word used to mean. And there are about five or six different words translated prayer, pray and prayer in the New Testament. And every one of them are different words meaning asking. Ask with thanksgiving. That's what we're doing. But asking, that's really godly. It's terrifically godly to ask. Because asking not only expresses our faith and dependence upon God, it also brings him glory. For because it is saying that you can look after this God. That's why I pray and we pray for everything and anything because there's nothing too big for God to look after. And there's nothing too small for God to be concerned about. He has the hairs of my head numbered. I'm helping him in this regard by reducing the numbers daily. <laughs> every combing, every shower, you know, I'm making it easier for God. That's so close to blasphemy, I better withdraw that, right? <laughs> but he's concerned with everything down to the hairs of our head. There's nothing too small for God to love and care for us. But there's no issue so big that it's beyond the almighty. And so as I turn any matter into prayer, I'm expressing my faith in him and I'm giving him glory, whatever it may be. I mean, I ask God for a parking spot. Coming in at night, the other night I did. Gee, you guys have got a lot of cars. <laughs> I, I wondered whether there's more bodies than cars. But... I said, I'm looking for the parking spot under the trees. Who knows what's going to be, how, how the birds are. Anyway, I thought, here I am praying. I ask God to provide me a parking spot. What am I doing when I'm doing this? I'm saying, God, you are able to do anything. Even finding a car park for me, wherever it might be. And, you know, when you're asking for a car park spot in town and, and it doesn't appear and you're asking God and it still doesn't pray... Has God failed to answer your prayer? No, he's teaching you to leave earlier. <laughs> or to go by public transport. There's all kinds of things God's doing, but he's certainly hearing you and caring for you, and he will give you what is best for you in the circumstance. So be constant in prayer, steadfastly praying all the time. It's just the natural breath of the person of faith to be asking God for everything and anything. May I say also, I found it as a very useful part of evangelism. Because when I'm talking to outsiders, after a conversation, especially about anything that's difficult, I say, how about we pray about that? They look completely shocked. They've never thought of this. And so without asking, without waiting for them to say yes or no, I bow my head and I start praying. <laughs> and then they pray along with me too. And you hear them say, Amen. And suddenly our relationship has changed. Suddenly we've introduced the third person into our relationship, haven't we? That now we're no longer just two secularists, Australians chatting to each other. Now we're supernaturalists in our conversation. I had two lovely old people across the road from me in one house, uh, Joe and Josephine, who were actually Giuseppe and Jessapina, but, you know, for the Australians, they translated it into simple language, Joe and Josephine. They couldn't speak much English. They were Italian. And uh, they, they were lovely, lovely people who always greeted us warmly, but we had this terrible problem of, of language communication. And I saw Josephine one day walking up and down, distressed, really distressed. And so I went across to her and I said, what's is your problem? Is there a problem? And she said, oh, Joseph, Joseph, hospital, hospital, heart, heart, hospital, hospital. 
And so I said, well, well you know, let's pray. Good Italian Roman Catholic mother. You know, you, you, you've got to go up to the church and have the priest pray for you, haven't you? But here I am standing in the middle of the street saying, let's pray. And so I prayed for Joseph, tried to keep it in very simple English languages to pray for Our relationship changed from that day onwards. We were never the same neighbours than we were before. I didn't get very far with the gospel with Joseph. <laughs> the language always stood in the way of me actually communicating clearly to her. And she didn't want to talk to anybody else but me because I'm the man who prayed. But I couldn't help her more than that. But it changes everything when you, you bring in prayer. Very simple way of helping people think that what you're saying, you actually mean. Because <laughs> you, you believe in God and you don't pray, that doesn't make sense. You believe in God and you ask for things. It's very simple and straightforward. Anyway, secondly, notice what Paul's prayer request is. Verse, five, verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Now, that is incredible. That's amazing. That's an, one of the most extraordinary verses of the Bible. I don't know if you ever noticed it or not. Here he is in prison, actually in chains in prison. He doesn't know whether he's going to be released. He doesn't know if he's going to be killed. I mean, it's not like one of our prisons and it's not like our justice system where you can appeal and appeal and appeal and appeal and, and you can live in hospital, in prison for years and years, eating good food at the expense of everybody else. No, it was Roman justice. It was good justice for the ancient world, but it's nothing like modern justice. And when he's writing to the Philippians, you may remember, he doesn't know if he's going to be released or not. And so in the depth of the options of the Roman prison, he comes out with that wonderful verse, which is for many of us such a motto verse. For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I don't know which it's going to be, you see. When you're in prison, one thing you want to have is an open door. Be it opened by an angel like the Apostle Peter had it like that, or be an earthquake and the government official like in Philippi releasing Paul from the Philippian jail or whether just a lazy forgetful prison guard doesn't lock the door escape is the obvious highest hope of every prisoner I want the door open I want to get out of here and so Paul naturally asks the Colossians to pray for him that in prison he may have an open door it's the most obvious prayer for a prisoner this is what makes so incredible, amazing and extraordinary. He asks for an open door for the word of God, not for Paul the prisoner. An open door for the word of God, not to escape, but to evangelise. You see, he wrote to the Philippians how his imprisonment advanced the cause of the gospel because as a result of him being in prison, all the Praetorian Guard heard the gospel. Can you imagine being chained up with Paul overnight? <laughs> There's an evangelistic opportunity he would not miss. The whole Guard heard about the gospel and why he was put in prison. Well, now, here in Colossae, he's in prison again. He was always in and out of prison. You know, he, his hobby was investigating Roman prisons, as best I can see. And so here he is in prison again. And what does he want? He wants the door for the word of God to be opened so that he might explain the mystery of the gospel. I mean, that's a technical term, which means world mission, the secret of the gospel, the salvation, not just of the Jews, but of the nations, of the Gentiles, of, Gentiles, of the prison guards of the people around about, you see, he wants to make it clear, which is what he ought to do. He wants to be able to speak it as he ought to do, that Jesus Christ is Lord for everywhere. You see, we take it for granted, thanks mainly to the Apostle Paul, frankly, that the gospel is not, sorry, that the gospel is for everyone, not just the Jews, but all peoples everywhere. One God over all people. That is a Christian novelty. It wasn't until the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that people came to an understanding of the one God over all peoples, bringing salvation to all mankind. So it's a Christian 
weird idea that the apostle is pushing. He says, I'm in prison for that idea. That's why I'm here for the nations. I'm here for the Gentiles. But I want the door opened, not so that I can get out of the prison, but so that I can make it known even to those in the prisons that this is the case. In a sense, this response of Paul to his imprisonment is an illustration of basic Christianity. See, he's died to self and now living for Christ and the gospel. So in a tough situation of life, he's not like so many of us, complaining about our situation, bemoaning our suffering. No, no. He's trusting in God's sovereignty that this must be good for him and for the gospel. And so here's an opportunity for the salvation of other people. We go through tough times. We go through awkward situations. We go to places we don't want to be and with people we don't want to be. Stop grumbling. You believe in the sovereignty of God? Guess who put you there? Open your eyes and look at the opportunity to speak to the other people who are around about you. You most likely don't want to be there either. They've got to put up with you, grumbling menace of a person. No, no, stop grumbling. Rejoice and be glad and take the opportunity. See, I know a young man in prison at the moment. He's in for a very, very serious charge on which, sadly, he's been found guilty. He's not 21. He's only... Well, he's doing his HSC in prison. That's a hard way to live, isn't it? But he's leading Bible studies in prison and under the mercy of God has led several other of the prisoners to the Lord and Saviour. And some of the families have been so thankful to him for the ministry he's exercising in prison. God has put him there to do a work that the prison guards can't do, not even the chaplains can do, because he's one of them. He's as guilty as they, but he knows the forgiveness and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he can explain the purposes of God. I know a man, I knew a man with very severe schizophrenia. He frequently spent time in psychiatric units. He was an extraordinary man. He told me that he didn't mind going into the psychiatric units because when he was there, it gave him opportunities to tell the other patients about the Lord Jesus. He said they don't trust the nurses and they don't trust the psychiatrists, but a fellow patient is someone they all sit and listen to. And he said, I get to tell them about Jesus. I wouldn't want his condition on anybody. His life was so difficult, so miserable. But he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in the depth of that misery, he found the opportunity to speak. Makes you humble in a sense, because you think, gee, I'm, I'm not in any of those situations, and I find it difficult. Here are people in extreme situations, and they're taking the opportunity. The open door for the word. Isn't that an extraordinary verse? And as Paul wanted the Colossians to pray for him in his world evangelism, even in prison, he wants them to have the wise walk in relationship with others. So verse 5, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. We need to pray for this, friends. Pray for your own wisdom and each other's wisdom. How am I going to relate to my neighbours in a way that will bring the gospel of Jesus to them. I live in a block of units now. How am I going to relate to my labours in the block of units I live in? How am I going to participate in the body corporate meetings, which sometimes get very heated as people push and defend their own interests? Someone have painted blue, someone have painted green. What should I do? I should be the peacemaker who doesn't care whether it's blue or green because, frankly, in eternity, it won't matter what colour I've argued for, will it? You say, but Philip, you really like green. And I say, Philip, I really want to hear my neighbours to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to see reconciliation taking part. Who cares whether it's green, blue or polka dots? 
I do, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> How am I going to act in the office when the backstabbing politics is taking place and people are advancing their cause or derailing other people? How am I going to speak in that gossip group at school amongst the girls where they are picking on some girl and rubbishing her, excluding her and trying... How am I going to act? How am I going to speak? When I'm in the presence of outsiders at the shops or in the PNC meetings at school or in the family and the wider family gatherings, and I need the wisdom of God. Pray for it, brothers and sisters, pray for it. That you might be wise, to walk wisely in the company of the outsiders so that you might speak and act rightly as the occasion comes for you. Notice the second half of the verse, making the best use of the time. Taking whatever opportunity comes your way, using the time available as best you can. That's the wisdom you need to know this is the moment to speak. This is the time that I've got. I must take it up. You see, we tend to procrastinate in our relationships, don't we? With the relationships with the outsiders. We'll say, well, I'll just make friends, I'll make friends, I'll make friends. I'll... Oh, they've died. Well, never mind, I'll make friends, I'll make friends. And I never get around to actually telling them the gospel. I'm always building the bridge, but I never walk over it. No, you've got to have the wisdom to know it's time. Time to speak, time to speak up. We have to get and use and act with wisdom. Yeah, ponder it, yeah, just... I'm just giving illustrations. This is not what the Bible is saying, just illustrating, right? Uh, one of the wise things to do with our, uh, outsiders is to create the relationships in which you can speak. You don't have to be deep and personal friends. They don't have to be best friends before you share the gospel with them. See, I had some missionary friends in Paris that I were impressed. They, Paris, I don't know if you've been there, but there's beggars everywhere in Paris. It's terrible. You can't get on the train. You can't travel around the streets without beggars, always. What do you do in this context? You've got a heart for people. They, they in their wisdom, chose to adopt a beggar. There were three different missionary families, and they all chose a beggar, and they adopted the beggar. And so they have passed by all the other beggars in the street, but that one, because the beggars always sat at the same spot, being in the... They would sit down with that one, get to know them, hear the story, learn where their family was background to, and actually care for them physically. Because they said, I can't do everything, so I'll do the thing I can do. What? what? You, said, you said this week, and I can't remember which one of you said it, you, know, you can't know everybody here, but at least get to meet three people. Uh, some of you have still got two to go over morning tea. <laughs> Right? But you, right? that's, that's what you should be doing, isn't it? You can't help every beggar of Paris, but you can find one. Get to know him. And that, in that context, of course, the conversation becomes straightforward. I told you about my father-in-law. Never went shopping. Always went to see his friends. And while he was there, picked up a few things to go home with. Uh, he made friends everywhere he went. Well, one of my other friends... He says, yes, always go to the same petrol station. Try and go at the same time each week too because the same person will be serving and you can get to know that person. And as you get to be, if you go to a different petrol station every time just because it suits you, you never get to know the person. You, it's very hard to start the conversation, isn't it? I'd say, purpose, always go to the same barber. I, I, I was getting somewhere really with a barber. I mean, it took a long time then, of course, we weren't allowed to go to Barber's. When I came back, the shop was shut and they were gone. So I never got there. I missed the opportunity of time. But I'm now going to a new barber. It doesn't work because they keep changing the, the actual cut, the hair cutters each week. So I just get along the conversation. Next time I get there, I... Yeah. So, but go to the same one. Go to the same hairdressers. Hairdressers, they love talking, don't they? Sometimes they dress the hair as well, but they love talking. And here's the opportunity. You need to make the friends. Well, go to a gym in order to make friends for the gospel. <laughs> While you're there, build some muscles or try and regain old ones, as the case may be. Uh, likewise, the, the P&C meetings. I used to go to the P&C meetings in my local public school with my children in primary school. You know, a thousand kids in the school. There are only six parents who ever went to P&C. 
And so we became good friends. That gives us the opportunity then to speak. It's, but it's being wise about it. Stop and think about the outsiders you can reach with the gospel. Now, I was the senior minister at the cathedral in Sydney, which is the big old church right on Town Hall Station next to the Town Hall building. All kinds of famous people attended to church there. Prime ministers, governors, governors general, the premiers, the leaders of opposition. So I, I met all kinds of famous people. I did meet the Queen and Prince Philip. This hand has sh shaken the hand of... On one occasion, I had 10, well, 5, 10, 15 minutes with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, Prince William and Kate, now the Prince of Wales and the Princess of Wales. I, I prepared for the day. I mean, it was a big occasion. All the famous people were turning up to church suddenly to sit in the same building with the Prince and Princess. And I had to be in charge of running of the whole, the whole day. And so I prepared everything to go very well that day. It was months of preparation that our church was involved in. But I forgot. I forgot to prepare what to say to them. How to bring up the very thing that I wanted to say. How to bring up the subject of the gospel with them. I ushered them from the car all the way into the church and to their seats. That was part of my job, you see. I spent 10 so minutes talking to them there and I ushered them back out another time with them. I ushered them into a church to sing the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ and to hear the great word of salvation and I forgot to take the opportunity provided to me to say anything to them about the Lord Jesus. We discussed the weather. We discussed the building. We discussed cabbages and kings we didn't discuss Jesus just because I hadn't planned. I wasn't wise. I was a silly fool at that point. If I had been wise enough to make the most of the opportunity to take with the prince and his wife, I would have needed the gracious speech of verse 6, seasoned with salt. It's a funny combination, isn't it? Grace and salt. One is gentle and smoothing. The other is sharp and astringent. You know, the gracious word brings comfort and is appropriate to the situation and time. It brings peace and it brings mercy. Whereas the salty word brings change. It doesn't fit into the situation. In fact, if salt has lost its saltiness, it's, it's, it's useless. The salt is provoking, provoking and challenging. And so you've got to have gracious words seasoned with salt. But that's the gospel. That's the evangelism, you see. To those who are being saved, the gospel is the sweet perfume of life. And to those who are perishing, the gospel is the pungent stink of death. Perfume, stench. Same gospel. So we speak graciously of the grace of God in his loving mercy, extended by the death of his son to whomever we speak, to the ends of the world, to, to the ends of humanity, to the degenerate and to the moralist, to the atheist and the inquirer, uh, to anybody and everybody who will listen. But as we speak these kind words of salvation, we also speak the salty words of the righteous judgment of God, calling upon everybody to repent and turn to the Lord and to have faith and trust in the Saviour, to turn back to God while there's time to find mercy and forgiveness, which is available. In one sense, it's the salt which adds the flavour to our speech for the, for the kind, gentle words of Forgiveness and love often lulls our audience in, off to comfortable acceptance and, and sleep. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Oh, I'm so glad. I love me too. <laughs> it doesn't actually convert people, that message. Whereas the salt livens up the conversation 
that people can hear the value and the importance of the fact that God loves you. And by this way, we're able to have finally the appropriate answer to each person. Different people have different problems, different questions, and we must be prepared to enter into whatever problem or question they have. But that doesn't mean you have to have thought out every answer to every question before you ever speak to anybody. In fact, if you speak the gospel, you will be answering questions that you don't even know they have. You don't have to be an encyclopedia. You don't have to be the Dr. Google of evangelism to be able to speak to people because the gospel itself wisely, graciously, with salty flavouring, answers people's questions. That's, that's part of the miracle of it. I preached once at the Clancy Auditorium at the University of New South Wales. It's a great place, thousand people. It sits there and everybody can see easily. And it was full. And it was preaching the gospel. I think it was on the subject of what is a Christian and how to become one, which is a pretty easy... If you can't get the gospel from that topic, retire. You know, you, you've lost the plot from there, haven't you? And so I'm preaching this and I cause a huge family quarrel because one of the non-Christian men who were there accused his Christian sister of the sister having informed me about the man's life, about his sins and his problems, and that he said by her telling me all the details of his life, I had used them to publicly shame him and manipulate him. And he was really angry. But of course she hadn't told me. In fact, I didn't know he was there. In fact, I didn't even know he existed. <laughs> you see, I just explained the word of God and the word of God exposed his sinfulness and the spirit of God deeply bit into his conscience. And the only explanation he could have was, I'd been tipped off about him. I hadn't been tipped off about him. <laughs> See, the word of God answers questions. I didn't know him. I didn't know what his questions were. I didn't know what his problems were, but I was answering them. Wasn't I clever? No. The word of God is clever. Sometimes, of course, you have to answer specific questions. Even go and research an answer for somebody. I remember talking to a young postman, a lovely fellow he was, about becoming a Christian. And he said he would, but he just had one question which was a stickler. What could it be? What do you think is the question that would stop a man becoming a Christian? I guarantee not one of you can think of the answer. Because he said to me, what do you ever make of that book by Eric and Denikin called The Chariots of the Gods? Most of you have never even heard of the book, have you? I hope. Because it was one of the most silly books that was ever been written and published in the English language or any other language. I think it was Swiss. It was published in the late 1960s. And it was really dark. It was stupid. As I had spoken the gospel with him, he understood that his hero, Eric von Däniken, must be really right and I'm wrong, or must be really wrong and I'm right. And in fact, he'd already come to realise I was right and the book he was staking himself on was wrong. And I have to go and find out what the book was about. <laughs> and I may say it was the easiest conversation I've ever had afterwards because it was the stupidest book I think I've ever had to read. He was a lot hard to show that it was stupid. And he professed his faith in Christ. Okay, well, we come to the end of this study. You see this lovely little passage? It's not about evangelism, but it's how to live with outsiders. And the key way of living with outsiders is speaking the gospel to them, being wise and how we do it and gracious. So it, it, it is about it. It's a bit about the how-to, but it's... We well, come to the studies at the end of this, right? The least important is how-to. And yet it's the one that will determine the value of what we're doing. I once preached my heart out in a series of prayer. At the end of the series, one old saint came to me and said, Philip, that was great. It's the best series of sermons I've ever heard on prayer. <sighs> but you know, Philip, she said, as a result of that series, I guarantee there's not one bit of difference in the congregation's prayer life. 
<laughs> How to destroy the preacher by telling him the truth. She was right. Talk about being deflated. It was all the more because she was right. See, without organising some prayer meetings, without sitting with people and praying with them, without an action plan to implement the change, it was never going to happen. Because most people can't move from the theory to the practice. Friends, that's why, that's where we are on the topic of evangelism. It's not a theory, it's a practice. It's not hearing what I've said, it's doing what matters. If you don't practice it, you'll never do it. So how? The how to this? There's hundreds and hundreds of different ways. That's part of the problem. And there's none that I can say, this is the way you must do this way. There's different ways. And whatever your pastor is saying and giving leadership in this way, stick with him. Right? If he's using two ways to live, terrific. If he's doing evangelism explosion, terrific. I don't care. But stick with him in doing what it is. Do it together. Have triplets in praying together. Go and run a mission so you can see it. Engage in a training program like Two Ways to Live. Get hold of the, the new Tony Payne book on it. Uh, go to a beach mission. You're a student, make sure you go to the national training event and do the evangelism afterwards. See, we've covered what evangelism is. It's telling people about Jesus Christ as Lord. We've covered why to evangelise. Because we've been saved for good works. And so we're going to be called to account for our good works. And so out of the fear of the Lord, you should evangelise. We've been saved by the love of Christ. And so out of our love of the Lord, we should evangelise. We've been saved by the resurrection, which creates the new creation. And so out of the new creation, we should see everybody in a different way to evangelise them. We've been saved to become the ambassadors for Christ. And so we've been given our message, go to the world representing Christ and call upon the world to be reconciled to God. What it is is to take action and that's over to you. Let me try with a simple one for you. Monday, especially if you're at work, people say, do you have a good weekend? Okay? Be wise. What are you going to do? The answer that most... Christians give is, yeah, I saw an interesting movie on Sunday night. Or, oh, yeah, I cut, caught up with the family. Self-censorship is a great evil. Stop it. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, I went to church. No, that's not good enough. Did you have a great weekend? I heard a really interesting sermon at church. Now, that's much better, isn't it? Of course, they can say at this moment, yeah, I'll have another coffee, thanks. <laughs> but if they've got any touch of sensitivity, they'll say, what was it about? Right? This, you know you're going to be asked, so get your answer ready that you can speak about the Lord. Well, you didn't go to church this weekend, you spent all weekend in church instead. So what are you going to say? Did you have a good weekend? Don't say, oh, yeah, I went to a conference. <laughs> you say, yeah, I heard some really interesting talks. Okay, you've got to tell a lie sometimes. Okay, <laughs> I, heard some really interesting, I heard some really interesting talks about how and why I should be explaining to you about Jesus. John Chapman, the great old Aussie evangelist, he had a wonderful line when anybody said, what do you do, mate? He says, oh, the Anglican Church pays me to explain to you why you should become a Christian. <laughs> I mean, that's a great line, but you've got to be paid by the Anglican Church to do it to be able to use that line. Right? But think out your line for Monday morning. Right? Buy up the time, take the time, make the most of the time, be wise about the time and think up the gracious and salty answer that will open up the opportunity to tell them the most wonderful news that you can tell them. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again in victory over Satan, Jesus Christ is the Lord. 
and you can be forgiven of all your sins as you acknowledge him as your Lord and Saviour. What a, what, a, what a message to have in my mouth. And they say, did you have a good weekend? And I say, yeah, I saw a footy game on the television. It's hopeless, isn't it? You're not hopeless. You can do better than that, can't you? And so I'm going to pray, leading you in prayer. And I have a suspicion the muses are going to creep up behind me. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> Something like that? You're going to creep up behind me. That's even more dangerous. <laughs> he won't let me interview, be interviewed by him, but he's going to creep up behind me. Okay, <laughs> let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he's our Lord and that he is our Saviour. We thank you that he rules the universe. We thank you, Father, for all the things that you give us in life. The life itself, the friends, the family, our church, the church family that we have here. Thank you for the ones that we've met that we've never met before. Thank you for the old friends with whom we've deepened our relationship. Thank you for your word, Father, teaching us about why we should be speaking and what we should be saying. And Father, we thank you that we proclaim not ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as their slaves for your sake, for Jesus' sake. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for so many things. But we pray, Father, that you would give us the boldness, that you would take away our life so much that we will not be afraid or ashamed in any fashion to be able to speak of Jesus to those around about us. And Father, we pray that you would use our words to bring such conviction to people that they would repent and put their faith in Jesus and come to know you as their Father because your Spirit is at work in their lives. So bless the words that we use, Father, to bring salvation to others and glory to yourself. And we ask it in Jesus' name.